Good evening, everybody. I'm Ken Burns. I'm so happy to be joining you with the Next Generation Angel Award uh, students who participated in National History Day and have already had a moderated session, uh, moderated by uh, Bennett Singer uh, with the LOC, the Library of Congress Levine Prize uh, winners uh, of this year. And I am very excited uh, that they have in just a couple of days, uh, a student history film festival in Philadelphia where their films, their wonderful films uh, will be shown uh, in front of 600 other people. Um, I just like to start uh, the, hit the ground running and just ask in alphabetical order um, the students here who've made these great films to give us your name and where you're from and uh, the name of your project. And we'll just move through and we'll start with Kryn. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Kryn Blagan. Um, I'm in from Wisconsin. Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And I did my documentary this year about the 1967 to 68 open housing marches in Milwaukee. So a local topic. Um, it explored redlining and civil disobedience. Um, it like all the complexities of uh, youth activism um, and how that kind of pertains to us today and how that um, how the actions of the youth um, and Father Grappi and the NAACP in 1976 and 68 um, affect us today, as well as the, um, you know, Vela Phillips and all, um, everyone doing it from the other end of, of the field. That's great. That's great. It's a wonderful film, Aubrey. Hi, um, I'm Aubrey Greer. I'm here from Vancouver, Washington, and the title of my documentary was McCall Whaling Rights, A Moral Debate of Cultural Preservation. Can you talk just a little bit about what the film is about? Uh, yeah, my topic is also pretty local. Um, the Macaw Tribe uh, is located around the Puget Sound area in Washington, so real close to Canada. And um, basically my documentary covers uh, the big issue on whaling in their community and basically the conflict between the media, the tribe, and um, also the government as far as regulations for whaling and um, the struggle that the tribe had with uh, upholding their treaty rights with that issue. Great. Lachlan. Hi, I'm Lachlan Gebhardt from Lander, Wyoming. My documentary was Wolves, Bloodthirsty Menaces, or Stewards of the Land. And it was about the wolf reintroduction into Yellowstone National Park um, from 1994 to 1995 and how it affected the people around the park, visitors inside the park, politics, and um, ranching. Wow. Uh, I know a little bit about that story and you've done such a great job, Macy. Hello, my name is Macy Hill. I'm zooming in from Livingston, Texas, um, and my film is titled Communist in the Cornfields. And my film is about the historic trip that Nikita Khrushchev took to Roswell Garth's cornseed farm in 1959 in the midst of the Cold War and the citizen diplomacy that took place between the two men. That's great. Abigail? Hi, I'm Abigail Peters. I'm from Roseville, Minnesota. And my film was titled Fight for Our Wilderness, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Act. And it went over the history of the Boundary Waters Act, which passed uh, legal protections for the Boundary Waters, which is in northern Minnesota, as a wilderness and featured the debate between people living in the area in northern Minnesota and tourists from around the country who wanted to visit the wilderness. That's great. And last but not least, Jesse, can you talk about, tell us who you are and where you're from and your, about your project? Yes. Um, so I'm Jesse Henderson. I'm from Cleveland, Tennessee, and my project is More Than Potatoes, the USS Jamestown, and um, the mission um, to Ireland during um, the Irish potato famine in the 1840s and just the United States response to that and the effects that that had on humanitarian diplomacy in the future up to now. 
Okay, so what I want to do is all oh, of these are so fascinating, interesting. I remember growing up as a kid in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, Crin, uh, and following what was going on in Milwaukee and Father Grappi, and I made a film about the national parks, and then it sort of ends on the wolf uh, introduction in Lachlan. So let, let's go backwards now and and start, Jesse, with you. And um, you, I, I'd like to just ask you all briefly how you chose your so topics, but I think uh, particularly for you, Jesse, you have a topic in the early 19th century or the mid 19th century. And so you've got very limited uh, uh, photographs. Can you talk about how you were drawn to this project and then how you solve that problem archivally of, of a lack of, obviously there's no newsreels and there's no uh, of photographs or probably very few photographs, Jesse. Um, yeah, so um, I originally chose my topic because I'm really interested in American military history. Um, specifically, lately, I've been focusing on naval history, so I knew I wanted to do a project about that. Um, and then I was trying to obviously find something to fit the overall theme. And I was also interested in like the Irish potato famine. And so these really like correlated, but it was a problem because it's such an early topic. Um, so it took a lot of scouring Internet archives because I wasn't able to go to Boston to actually get access to them because of COVID. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, in my documentary, we have a few like screen grabs from books or um, things like that to kind of fill in the spaces that I can't find just actual, obviously photographs from. Um, and then there are drawings in there and paintings and things like that to fill the lack of imagery. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel for you. Uh, 10 minutes uh, may seem like forever. I'm working on a six part, at least 12 hour history of the American Revolution. I'm going back even farther and it's, you know, trying to find visual solutions is is really, really challenging in a, in a way. And congratulations uh, on, on being able to do it so well. Abigail, uh, talk to me, to us, uh, share how you're drawn to the project and then what are the kind of principal elements that you use to tell your story and what applications in research or organizational things that you did to aid in your production? Yeah, so I originally was drawn to my topic because I live in Minnesota and I've actually visited the Boundary Waters a few times. And I also have family who lives close to the Boundary Waters up in Northern Minnesota. And so I've kind of firsthand seen the conflict between Kind of the tourists and recreational users of of the wilderness and then the people who live there all year round and so looking into that history i found the boundary waters in particular had really like divisive uh political debates over what it should be considered it was considered a wilderness but it had so many exceptions to it and thus it had the need for its own act to resolve that and um I did find a lot of sources just from like there's current issues going on around the boundary waters. So there's plenty of history on the boundary waters, but a lot of the debates that I was looking into all happened behind closed doors. Right. There were like closed doors lawyers agreements between Chuck Dayton and um, uh, Ron Walls um, up in Northern Minnesota. And then dates within each of the conflicting organiz or organizations. And so to solve that, I had to reach out and I did a lot of interviews. I, I think I interviewed five different people for this topic. And that's how I was able to like piece together all of the little debates that brought together this whole act. And get behind the closed doors. Yes. Yeah, that's that's great. The interviews are often our saving grace, aren't they not? Macy, uh, communists in the cornfield. Uh, obviously, you got us uh, with the title, and many of us were alive when uh, this visit took place, but I don't think we know the particulars. Tell, tell us why you were drawn to it, and also some of the challenges that you faced while you were doing this. Well, I am. Um, I was really drawn to the time period specifically um, before I'd even chosen the topic because I had never really um, studied that era of history. And we, at least for me specifically, I had not really covered much of that in my typical history classes. Um, so I was very interested in that time period. Um, but my mother and I actually enjoy watching documentaries like um, historical documentaries together when we have free time. It's kind of like our bonding thing. Um, and so we, one weekend, actually came across a documentary called The Cold War Roadshow. 
and it was an excellent film. Um, it was about Nikita Khrushchev's entire trip to the United right. States. Um, the portion about his trip to Iowa was only about a good maybe 10 minutes of the entire hour, hour and a half film. Um, but I was so intrigued by it because it was just so out of the ordinary for um, a leader of a full country to be walking around in the cornfields with his farmer friend. Like that was just so unique and not something you typically see in the history books. So I was definitely drawn to that topic. And how did you make it come alive? I mean, you've got the general view. Khrushchev visits the United States. He's the head of the Soviet Union. We're in the middle of a very, very cold war. There's tensions. The nuclear annihilation is on everyone's mind. The idea that the world could just instantly end. Um, and and this is a kind of an opening, a little thaw in that in that cold war. How did how did you help tell the story? Did you have witnesses? Yes, so my oral history interviews that I conducted were tremendously helpful. Um, I spoke with um, Elizabeth Garst. She was Roswell Garst's granddaughter. She was there the day uh, Khrushchev visited the farm. There's some um, very few images, but there were a couple and a little bit of grainy footage of um, her actually being like patted on the head by Khrushchev. Um, so she was kind of able to give me some insight as to what the general feeling was that day um, on the farm. And then I also spoke with Harry Bucky. He was the son of Lester Bucky, the owner of the meatpacking plant that Khrushchev visited while he was in Iowa. Um, he wanted to visit the meatpacking plant just to get an idea of the um, greater produce of livestock yield that the corn um, that Garst was producing was producing. Um, so those sources were excellent as far as the general feeling of the day um, and kind of what the actual people around the town and the consensus among them and among, I mean, really the country at the time. So interesting. So fascinating. Lachlan, and you've got an amazing topic because the wolf continues to be uh, an amazing uh, touchstone, a sort of flashpoint for argument and debates and kind of uh, political divides between people and communities based similarly to the boundary waters that Abigail is talking about, where you've got the tensions between the local folks and the tourists and, and people coming in. You've got a larger political uh, thing. You've got unbelievable history and folklore. Uh, I guess what drew you to this? Obviously, you live in Lander, Wyoming, which I have actually been to uh, a few times um, in its very beautiful country. And, and I want to know how you, if you were able to stay impartial in, in this, or where do you think you come down on it? So, as you know, I'm in Lander, Wyoming, which is only about two and a half hours from Yellowstone. And I visited, I visited Yellowstone since I was probably three years old. I would go up there and because we had access to optics that let you see long distances, right? that's really the only way you can see wolves. So I saw a lot of wolves going to Yellowstone National Park. And it just kind of sparked something inside me. And I just loved that creature. And when I started to get talking with some of the wolf volunteers who volunteered tracking the wolves, they were talking about the wolf reintroduction and how people didn't like it. And that just blew my mind because I, I thought these animals were incredible. You would watch them and they would play with each other. They were almost like people. Right. So to stay impartial was almost impossible for me, but I worked hard to it. Um, so I definitely land with, you're just talking to it about me. <laughs> um, I definitely land more on the side of wolves should be there. Yes. But I, when my documentary was being created, I spoke to my grandfather about it and he aired on the side that wolves shouldn't be there. So I just kind of tried to pull the stuff that he said and the stuff that I thought and put it together to stay just in the middle of in the middle of the debate so you could see how some people felt and other people felt. 
Yeah, it's an amazing thing. And it's replicated all over, um, not just Wyoming and Montana, but so many different places in, in conservation where there are these tensions. And it's so important to listen to the other side and try to hear them no matter what your own sympathies would be. And I agree with you. I'm I'm a wolf guy. I thought it was a very symbolic thing to reintroduce into Yellowstone this, you know, large predator, this mammal, part of the ecosystem and the balance of things. And yet we do know the experiences of ranchers and farmers who are uh, proximate to that and the dangers. Uh, people have the memory of generations of, of the dangers that wolves pose to, to not just uh, livestock and property, but to, to humans themselves. So it's it's a very complicated thing. I think you did a really great job in, in, in parsing that. Uh, Aubrey, talk about your film a little bit, if you could. Yeah, of course. Um, so something that like really drew me to my topic, like, I guess like really motivated me through the whole thing is just like the fact that um, there were so many layers to the issue and um, the matter of like society's interpretation of whaling and how um, like for the average person that would know anything about it, you think commercial whaling, which is like pretty well known to be a corrupt industry. But when it comes to tribal whaling, um, it's something that people have a hard time connecting um, to something that is greatly important to the cultural well-being of a tribe because it's something so unique that doesn't exist anywhere else. Like the Macaw tribe is um, the only Native American tribe that had ever had whaling in their treaty, their original treaty from the 1800s. So this is something that people had a hard time um, understanding because their only like concept of whaling that had been established previously was commercial. So just the fact that it was such a multifaceted issue and something so unique to the Pacific Northwest, like it really um, like stirred something in me. And uh, I thought it was really important to do my project about this specifically because there really wasn't a lot of media coverage about this in the nineties or any other time. And I'm sure that uh, you know will challenge for you, but I think you can hear in the conversation that we're having that Abigail must be nodding a little bit, and certainly Lachlan is that you've got these tensions. Uh, I'm I'm making a film right now. It should be out next year called American Buffalo, and there were 30 million buffalo on the Great Plains after their territories in the West and the East had been squeezed a little bit, but they were a sustainable. Uh, thing for native peoples, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of various native tribes. And they used everything from the tail to the snort. I mean, the the, the sounds of the buffalo were in, in their rituals. And, and uh, Europeans, and particularly Americans, came in and for a century slaughtered them and in a particular uh, orgy of slaughter in the 1880s, reduced them to where people couldn't find them anymore. And we've had to work assiduously over the subsequent decades trying to actually save them from extinction. And if there hadn't have been Lachlan Yellowstone and there hadn't been a few um, native peoples, um, Aubrey in, in Montana, saving some bison and, and ha private herds in the East and all sorts of stuff, we might've lost the bison forever and it would just be a stuffed animal in a natural history museum or you know, um, in the paintings uh, from the 19th century. And we managed to save it, but our film is telling the first two acts of what's clearly a third act story. And, it, it, a lot of the bison ownership has been given back to native peoples, but there's a real tension between the kind of, as one of our commentators in the film says, the factory floor, the Great Plains was the factory floor, and the hide hunters were just skinning them and leaving this carcass to rot. And um, it, it, it was so shameful, and the, and the native peoples who'd signed treaties protecting their lands then found their lands, you know, gobbled up by the Dawes Allotment Act, and and you know they were promised that nobody would come south of the Arkansas River, uh, but as soon as all the, bi the bison were killed north of the Arkansas River, the bison hunters went down there with the tacit uh, permission of the army, and it ended up with the essentially people realized that if you eliminate the buffalo, you eliminate the the, the, the Indian. And that was a quite conscious uh, strategy that took place. So there are echoes of all of these kinds of tensions, uh, particularly in your film, Aubrey, but also I think 
Lachlan's hearing it and Abigail's hearing it. I'm, I'm certainly uh, hearing it in some of the things that we've done. Um, Prin, talk to me about um, Father Grappi. It was for a white kid growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, sympathetic in a family that was sympathetic to civil rights. There was this um, white uh, man of the cloth who was leading, uh, advocating for uh, black people in, in Milwaukee. Uh, he's an incredibly interesting figure and was incredibly divisive at the time. Yeah, yeah, Father Grappi was definitely a huge part of um, my whole topic. I actually struggled um, with the, his whole, um, you know, leadership role a little bit as I was uh, like laying out my story because I wanted it to be about the youth and I wanted it to show the like the, uh, the willpower and the strength of the youth. And so I didn't, for a while, I struggled with how to incorporate Father Grappi with that um, because, you know, it was this, uh, it was this like, white man leading yes. a, a group of like young black kids in the civil rights movement so that just the the whole idea of that i struggled with throughout my whole project because i didn't i i needed to be careful about how i portrayed it in my eyes um but he the difference that he made in like for history in milwaukee is profound um i don't think there could have been this movement without him um, and the youth marchers, but he was the one, uh, you know, he was the the media, the face of, right. of the council, and that was strategic on their end as well. Um, but I, he he knew where his place was, I think, because he he let the youth uh, kind of lead it in their own way. You know, he wouldn't um, he would kind of just sit back uh, in the meetings and say, "You guys can lead this. It's it's your movement." Um, which I think is very inspiring to a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, it's a really tough question because today we're super sensitive about appropriation and who speaks for whom and how we understand that. And and there's always, you know, in, in many subjects that I've done a kind of issue of white appropriation. You can't talk about Jackie Robinson without everyone saying, oh, you got to talk about Branch Rickey who brought him up or Pee Wee Reese who supported him. And a lot of that, their roles were enlarged as if no pun white people wanted to have skin in the game when it is in fact an African-American narrative. But in the case of Father Grappi, it's really different. You do have a, a passionate and authentic champion who doesn't want to get in the way of the movement, doesn't want to speak for it, but wants to lead it. And in fact, because of his position in the church and as a white person actually could do good. But it, it, it you know, particularly today, it's, it's tough to navigate. I think he navigated it it, it really, really well. So um, first of all, congratulations to all of you for, for these magnificent uh, projects. I learned a lot and, and I'm, I'm interested in giving you an opportunity to ask me whatever questions uh, you want to for the next period of time. Um, and then we can, we can continue to, to talk about whatever you want to talk about, the future documentaries, whatever it might be. But um, I think as you frame your questions, you might be thinking too about what you, what you've learned, you know, sort of what you've what you've stored here, and where you want to go to uh, in your next step, if, if if there is a next filmmaking step, which I hope for all of you there will be, because you've done such a great job. Um, so we're we've got all open mics. Um, I don't think we need to now keep going uh, alphabetically forwards and backwards. So uh, anybody can jump in and uh, ask questions. And, and even if you want to explore more or talk about more themes that are in your film, that's fine as well. So don't be shy. I have a, a question for you. Um, I know in my film, I had a moment like when I interviewed like um, a person that was marching as a as a youth marcher there was the moment where I was like oh you know this is I had no idea that this was the way my film was going to take um and I I wanted to know if you had if you remember any um specific moment from a project that you did that was like 
wow, I had no idea that I, my film was going to take me here or I, I had no idea this was what it was going to be. You know, this is this is the whole heart of it, uh, uh, it just is how how it works because you have an idea for a subject. You have to do a little basic research and that basic research is essentially superimposing on the topic a kind of framework, right? It's kind of didactic, it's essayistic, it's expository, this is what I want to do. And it's sometimes hard to liberate yourself from it because within that story, it's chaotic. I have in my editing room uh, a neon sign that says it's complicated. As you know, when you've got a scene that's working, you don't want to touch it. But I think you also realize that we've got a larger obligation to the truth and sometimes the complication of the truth. And so I don't know of a project that I've worked on, you know, maybe almost 40 films in which there hasn't been a moment when you've been reading or you have found a photograph, but more importantly, um, when you've done an interview where you just go, oh, I see, and something falls into place and it actually liberates you from the tyranny of that preconception, or if not preconception, just the basic building blocks of how, how you're going to do it. And so I, to me, you know, I'm, I'm about to do a big, important um, first interview for a film that I'm working on day after tomorrow. And just before the last few hours, I've been working on questions and I'm so excited to, to sort of try to assemble the questions and my colleagues have sent them in and I'm collating them. And then I realized that there's also, I have to be very careful of this person who is presupposing what the answers might be. And I just want to remember to be open so that if you've got, you know, question four, five, six, seven, how they respond to seven might suggest that there's a seven A, B, C, D, E, F, G, listen. And so, you know, one of the liberating things, one of the best parts of what I do is discovering that. And of course that's replicated again in the editing room because no amount of great archives, no amount of spectacular ways of figuring out how to do without archives, um, you know, as, as uh, we have to with the Irish uh, uh, famine, um replaces what happens when you put one scene together or two talking heads together two images together and something else happens so um i, I think that's central to the work and i i, I kind of well in the beginning it was scary uh, but i think now i've i've learned to not just welcome it but figure out how to prepare for it if that makes any sense i have um a question so did you ever consider going back to school and getting a higher um, level of education? And how do you feel like that would have affected your success? And, um, oh, sorry, no, no, go no, ahead. No. Okay, no. Um, and how would you suggest that someone um, begins a career in documentary filmmaking? Well, first of all, let me just tell you what happened when I worked with uh, Robert Penn Warren, who was the first poet laureate of our country and, and a great novelist and poet and an expert on Huey Long. He wrote a novel, the subject of a film he made, The Turbulent Southern Demagogue from Louisiana, who was assassinated um, as he was making a run for the presidency. Um, he once looked at me and he said, careerism is death. My, my story is pretty simple. From 12 years old, I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I just bought books. I read about the history of film. I steeped myself in Hollywood and foreign and all that sort of stuff. And I ended up going to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, where everybody was interested in social documentary still photography and filmmaking. So all of a sudden, I got everything rearranged. But something really interesting happened in the January term which was a free kind of creative period of my first year, January of 1972. None of you were born. Um, none of my children or grandchildren were born, but I um, started going out and shooting uh, on a small project and I've never bought another film book since. So if you wanted to continue to be that Hollywood feature director that I had first wanted to be, I think that there's probably a place where graduate school might have been helpful. What I realized that everything I thought I know, I knew I had to let go of. And the very practicalities, as, as you've all discovered, in the mistakes you've made more than in the successes you've had about sound, about lighting, about you know extraneous sound, the, the car going by or the, the jackhammers uh, going off. 
I, I think that I suddenly realized that this, that, that the world was going to be my classroom and that was how it was going to be. And I hoped that I would, it would be lifelong learning as it has. And I, 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 I still approach new projects with a kind of terror and fear and worry, and I'm pretty good at it. And I work with people who are really, really good at it. And still you want to keep that fresh, freshness alive. And so I would say that if you wanted to pursue a feature filmmaking career, there was probably a place where a graduate school might be helpful. But if you're doing the kinds of things we're talking about today, then I think life itself is going to be its, its best. The topics that you jump into, not just what is, but what was, if we're you, we all of us are in the history business. So, you know, it's, it's mostly was, um, but I think as we begin to pick our topics, if it's about what is or what was, then I think the world is going to be our best teacher. And I've never, I've really not had that uh, impulse. I, I, when I first started, I thought, well, I'll go to college and then I'll go to graduate school and become Hollywood director, but I'm really happy that that didn't happen. Yeah, I have uh, another question. So when you're filming or or um, exploring a topic that's much older before video cameras were made, how do you get video or, because video often pops more than just a still photograph. So how do you work around that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll just tell you, my father was an anthropologist, uh, but he was also an amateur uh, still photographer. I've just published a book of still photographs of the history of the United States from the you know, first year of photography, 1839, more or less to the present, all black and white, all a single photograph per page. And just trying to let the photograph speak for itself, minimal caption. In the back, there's a thumbnail of each photograph with a long prose description, but it's a way of, of, of saying, you know, where I manipulate, where I do the Ken Burns, you know, where I move in and, and, and do that stuff. I'm not gonna do that. You're now the director. Uh, you can spend, you know, I control how long you look at that photograph in my film. You can look at that for two hours if you want. And, and that's, you're, you're now the director of that. And it's acknowledging, Lachlan, that, that, that the still photograph was the DNA. And in fact, in film, persistence of vi vision suggests that, that these are all a series of still photographs that we're seeing. Our mind just can't uh, do that. As to popping, it's it's a big question. I think how you how you film them. That's why there is a thing called the Ken Burns effect um, that Steve Jobs just sort of you know superficially copying what I was trying to do, which was to wake up an image by going and energetically exploring it, um, is suggesting that you can overcome that. And if you're in as as we've been discussing um, with Jesse, a pre-photographic period or right at the cusp of it you're dealing with prints and you're dealing with maps and you're dealing with maybe some poetic license of a picture of this that, that was taken after that and, and you figure out. And so what I've done is, you know, I made uh, films on Benjamin Franklin recently and, you know, there's no photographs and there's no footage, but you can tell a pretty good story with the paintings and with live uh, cinematography. You know, we didn't do any reenactments in the Civil War film, and there's not one photograph of battle of the hundreds of thousands of photographs taken during the Civil War and the hundred plus thousand that survived, the 16,000 that I filmed by hand. Not one of them is of battle. So you had to find out ways to animate things. And it might be the blur at the edge of an old daguerreotype. It might be a close-up of a cannon with sound effects. So you're not just looking at the at the old photographs, you're listening to them. Do you know what I mean? All of that is waking up this thing because I kind of disagreed with the people who said, you know, thank God I've got footage. Because sometimes the only thing with footage is you could just, you, you can only talk about the thing. If you've got footage of Babe Ruth, uh, you know, running around the bases, all you can talk about is that. But if you've got a photograph 
a portrait of Babe Ruth. You can talk about him running around the bases and how he did it with these tiny little ballet legs on this big bartender's uh, body and how he kind of minced as one of our commentators said. And you can see that in, in the footage, but you can imagine it in a still photograph. But in a still photograph, you can also talk about his unhappy childhood. You can talk about his relationship with his uh, teammates. You can talk about all sorts of other things. It's kind of a blank slate. And so I've tried to liberate um, the various elements that go in the film from any kind of hierarchy of good. You know, like footage is not necessarily the best. And if you look at our films where there is already an abundance of footage, like World War II or Vietnam, right? You'll notice that in the introductions, we have, we, we stop the footage and we just take still photographs to set up our first declarative bit of narration, you know? This, you know, the greatest cataclysm in history was how the first words of our World War II film after a little prologue, the greatest cataclysm in history began. And, and it's just still photographs. And we we really find that as, as, a, as a very helpful way to do it. So, um, you know, there's hundreds of, as you know, from having worked on films, like there's hundreds of techniques and things that you've got at your disposal. But I would like to suggest that for me, at least, I can describe eight elements, four are oral that you hear and four are visual. So the visual are pretty easy. You've got a still photograph, you've got footage, you've got talking heads and you have uh, live cinematography, right? There's lots of other stuff, maps, graphic stuff, but let's just say the two dimensional archives, the, the, the talking heads, the footage and the live cinematography of the now quiet battlefield, say in the case uh, of the Civil War. And orally is interesting, which is you have a third person narrator, often called the voice of God. But as you know, I use first person voices, people reading diaries and letters, and that would extend to the people talking. And then I have music from the period or music added and complex sound effects that help those photographs come alive. So each each film is a different calibration of all those things. The Lewis and Clark film, which is two, two hours, has a couple of minutes of us following people who recreated the keelboats or the portaging of canals over the Great Falls in, in, in Montana or, you know, out at the Pacific Ocean at, at Fort Clatsop in a reconstructed village there. Um, and then the rest of it is seeing what they saw. And, and it worked okay. Uh, in the Civil War, the only recreation, if you want to call that, is I had a horse gallop through a puddle. And that was one horse, and it was to represent a cavalry uh, guy. And it and it works, you know. It's sort of it, it's sort of funny the kind of solutions that you come up with. Uh, if you set yourself limits, I'm not a big fan of recreations. So that that limits what you can do and makes the task, for example, incredibly difficult in the American Revolution project, but we'll figure it out. I have a question about how you get inspiration for your topics. So you've done films on things from like baseball to the Civil War. Uh, how do you get those topics to begin with? And what are kind of the first steps into, I have this idea to, here's how I'm going to make a film about it. Yeah, it's so funny. You know, there's not a game plan, um, you know, uh, Abigail. It's it's really not, it's not really planned out, although we do plan the 10 year in 10 years what we're going to do. So, so the Buffalo Project is something we've been talking about for 30 years, right? And finally are doing, right? And it's almost done. Some projects are like that. You go, you know, uh, after the Civil War series, which... I, the, my first films, Brooklyn Bridge, The Shakers, Huey Long, um, The Statue of Liberty, and Congress, okay? Those are the first films that I did. Brooklyn Bridge would not have been built without this new metal called steel, which the Civil War helped to promote. And the guy who built the Brooklyn Bridge got his practical training as a bridge builder, as an engineer for the Union Army, okay? The Shakers declined precipitously after the Civil War, not because there weren't new, new converts to be had, but because a country that had just murdered 650,000, now we think 750,000 of its own people, the question of the soul of survival wasn't as big a business as it was before the Civil War. Huey Long came from a dirt poor North Louisiana parish that saw the Confederacy as a rich man's cause, and they refused to secede, right? 
it's plantation owners. We're not, we're not that, right? We're not, we're, we're just like, um, we're practically at the same level of the enslaved people, right? And um, the Statue of Liberty was originally intended as a gift from the French to Mrs. Lincoln to celebrate liberty despite her husband's um, ultimate sacrifice. And the greatest moment, uh, the most difficult moment, the most challenging moment in the history of the Congress is when there were two Congresses, one in Washington, D.C., and the other first in Montgomery, Alabama, and then later in Richmond, uh, Virginia. So uh, the Civil War is just hitting me every time I chose a topic, I had to do it. Afterwards, we we vowed we'd never do another film on war. And then lo and behold, we're doing one on World War II. Before that was even done, I knew I'd do Vietnam, which took 10 and a half years. And before Vietnam was done, I knew I'd do um, the, uh, the, the American Revolution. Another time, a friend of mine, uh, one of my writers and producers, was trying to sell me on a little story about the first cross-country automobile trip that he was fond of digging into in his spare time research. It took me 10 years, and I finally said, okay, let's do it. And we did it. The Buffalo, as I said, was 30 years, not because of lack of interest, but because of, of where it fit in. Um, the country music, We, my partner on that, Dayton Duncan, and I were working on another project trying to get some traction. We hadn't filmed anything, but we're doing some research and reading and we weren't getting anywhere. And I was visiting a friend. He said, do you ever think about country music? And it was like the biggest light bulb went on and I went back to it. I said, look, I don't want to take this away, but what about country music? And I tell you, we we, we never looked back and, and, and worked on it. So some of it is that kind of instantaneous inspiration. Some of it is just something that has to well up for a long time and find a particular spot uh, in it. And sometimes it's just, just basic curiosity. I never make a film about something I know about. I share with you the process of discovery. If I tell you, you know, what you should know in a particular subject, that's like homework, right? There'll be a test on that. But if I share with you, hey, you'll never guess what I learned, then there's more of that kind of enthusiastic element that is at the heart of storytelling, which is one person telling another person a story. It's just like, honey, how was your day? You know, and that's, that's the, I think, the basic human story. So I have a question too, um, and it's kind of similar to that, but your um, documentaries go so in depth into like a given topic. And I want to know, like in any of your films, and this might be too broad, but like, was there ever a moment in your research or discovery about a certain topic in one of your films where you had kind of like a like a paradigm shift about this whole big picture where like you were understanding so much about the given topic that your perception of it was just like completely like 180'd? Yeah, I think that's a like Crin's question too. You know, it's it's really of course. And I would really hope that was true, that that if you're staying open to learning, I mean, this is, I'm in the loft of a barn and, you know, I've been basically alone with Chester, my executive producer. And, but down there, we usually have 30 or 40 people coming for various screenings and we have tables set up and, and we, you know, on the Vietnam, we look at episode one in the morning with 30 or 40 people, 23, con, you know, historical consultants and feed them and then talk, talk about it, feed them, then look at episode two. If you've got 10 episodes, you all know the math. They're not done until Friday afternoon. So we've kind of lived together in this intensive stuff. And you, you realize that each of these scholars knows something that no one else knows and has recently learned things. And you'd see the other 22 look and go, oh, I had no idea. One person might be an expert on presidential tapes of Johnson and Nixon, which contrary to popular belief have not all been listened to and certainly have not been transcribed. And we would just listen to the tapes over and over and, and discover some stuff ourselves. Um, and they would have some insight or someone would had, had gotten access to classified material in Vietnam about North Vietnamese strategy and tactics of, about a very familiar event in that war that Americans think they know about. And so you begin to learn a little bit more from the passage of time from the American side. But then when you hear from the Vietnamese side, it, it's just revelatory and, and you get very, very excited about that. So I think you want to be able to pivot. You want to be able to understand um, how, just as the, the sign in the editing room says, it's complicated and you want to welcome that undertow. Uh, Wynton Marsalis, the great jazz composer and trumpeter, said in the jazz film, 
sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing are true at the same time. And there's a part of our rational mind that just really can't deal with that. That's like saying one and one equals three. But of course, that's what we're looking for in our art, in our faith, in our family, in our love, in our, you know, whatever it might be. And I think that um, you have to be able to understand that sometimes the greatest hero has flaws. The worst villain has human dimensions, you know, and that's what makes the story so complicated. But I think so much, so interesting. I mean, we lament in a binary media culture and computer culture, everything's a one or a zero, right? Everything's a red state or a blue state, a yes or no, a good or bad, whatever. Uh, so we, we just lament that we don't have any heroes as if a hero is some model of ideal perfection. When of course it is not, it's an invention by the Greeks to tell us about really complicated people who have flaws and strengths. I mean, Achilles has his heel and his hubris to go along with his great strengths. And, it, and, and you make these outside stories to remind people of their own you know, stuff that they have and hope that they can draw a lesson from that. And that's what storytelling is about. Is we share the stories of us and and hope that we learn a little bit about how there's no them. You know, I've made films about the US, but I've made films about us. And what I've learned, it took me decades to realize this, and it's a kind of a duh, is there's only us and there's no them. And whenever you see anybody saying, oh, there's a them making an enemy of somebody else, run away. Just because it just, there's only us. And the only way we survive is is by understanding how complicated uh, and diverse that us actually is. Um, I'm not I sure have... Aubrey, I really answered it. Yes, sorry, Macy. Um, so there are various types of filmmaking that you could have chosen um, to, like, uh, I guess, focus on. Um, so I'm curious as to what it was about historical documentaries that really grabbed your attention. I think it's accidental. I mean, I wish I could say there was this game plan, but as I said, I first wanted to be a feature filmmaker and then it was like, okay, documentaries. And it wasn't reluctant, it was wholehearted. Uh, but then I had always loved history, but I hadn't really known that. I mean, I have friends from junior high who said, oh man, it was so clear you're gonna go into history. And I go, no, it wasn't, you know, but they saw me better than perhaps I saw myself. I'd always been interested in American history, always, always. And so at Hampshire College, we didn't have a lot of funds for filmmaking. So we started a little cooperative, a, country, a company that the faculty oversaw, and we would make films for nonprofits. And um, we wouldn't charge them any salaries. We wouldn't rent our equipment. They would just pay for travel and meals if there was any involved and for the laboratory expenses. So in that day and age, in the early 70s, if you needed a half an hour film, it might cost you $60,000, but we could do it for six or seven or eight, right? And so we did it and they just have to understand Dan, it was amateurs doing it, overseeing the faculty. My film was for Old Sturbridge Village, which is like the colonial Williamsburg of, of Massachusetts, right? And, you know, at the, in that film, guess what? There's a third person narrator and there's first person voices. And the last shot of the film, it's all people in costume, you know, the interpreters who come each day, I'd go at dawn, ask them to come early before the, the visitors came and shear a sheep or sow uh, uh, seeds in a field or plow or do some such thing. And I had diaries. And then the last shot is a pan across a painting, right? This is the very last shot of the film, the only archive in the film, with the exception of a shaker seed label, a shaker seed packet label. Um, but, you know, it was all there. And if you told me that, this is 1974, 75, that you would be 69 years old in 2022, and you will have had, you've been doing only American history up to that point, and that, oh, by the way, you were committed to films in American history, all the way through the 1920s, then you know exactly what you're going to be working on. I would have said, you're out of your mind. That at some point I would have veered off and done something else. The biggest thing I've done something else is this book of still photographs, which is, of course, the building blocks of, of all of those films. 
I, yeah, uh, I don't know. It's a kind of mystery to me. Um, I have a question uh, regarding like kind of create back into creating um, films. How do you, when you're exploring a film or researching um, or like through the whole process, how do you, I don't know how to phrase this better, um, but like, how do you keep the soul? Um, yeah. I don't know, like you, if you have all of this, um, you know, information, all you've done all this research and like in my, in my, um, my perspective, when I was doing my film, I was like, I just want to get all this information out, but I had to like kind of cut it back. Cause I, I wanted to keep the soul of the, and the heart of the yeah. piece. So how do you manage that? That's, that's the whole game. I think all of you have asked such central essential and central questions to it. So, you know, I live in New Hampshire. We make maple syrup here, right? And we get 30, 30, 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. And I thought, man, this is the metaphor for what I do. I, you know, shoot 40 times the amount of stuff. And then you just have to, you don't boil it off or otherwise you have caramelized candy. Um, you have to evaporate it off and you have to keep it at a certain temperature that doesn't go to boiling. So it all steams off. And what you're doing is just reducing the water, reducing the water and getting something that's richer. So you're at once crin kind of attending to a process, which, you know, after a while you begin to trust. It's hard to trust in the very beginning. It seems so scary. And it does feel like at, at times when you get to know stuff, you can't quite remember what the original inspiration was, that emotional heart, the soul you're talking about. And so there's that for me, a prodigal journey that takes place in every production in which you kind of have to go far away to collect all that material, but to come back to that original impulse. And it's, it's hard and, and you see it sometimes when filmmakers have lost that, forgotten you know, what, what it was. And I, I think that's the, the key. I don't think there's any do's and don'ts. There's not a list of things um, other than the obvious stuff of, of persevering, of listening, of, knowing who you are and what you want and remembering why you were drawn to the subject in the first place. Uh, I remember when I was writing a fundraising letter for my first film on the Brooklyn Bridge, I told people that I was interested not just in excavating the dry dates and facts and events of the past, but I was interested in an emotional archaeology. Now, I don't know why I said that, but it's it's come to really define what I've done and I've stayed with it. And that emotional archeology span is not nostalgia or sentimentality. That's the enemy of good anything. But, but there are higher emotions that we talked about at the beginning and that our founders, when they said pursuit of happiness, they were not talking about pursuit of objects in a marketplace of things. They were talking about lifelong learning. They were talking about that soul that you're talking about, Bren. They, were, they wanted us to be, you know, John Adams said, you know, I study politics and war so that my son can study business and commerce so that my grandchildren can study art and music. I mean, that was the logical extension of a free people. We haven't really gotten there and we're still trying, uh, you know, desperately to figure out who we are and what it is we want and what it is. But I, but I, I think that struggle for the soul of something is it. It is exactly hit. That's the nail on the head. And the second you described it, you've lost it. So you have to go and go back and it's ineffable. It's it's sort of like, you know, somebody says, why is your best friend your best friend? Well, there's circumstances. We went to the same school or we ended up as roommates or we were in the same biology class or we our parents were best friends or we used to vacation, whatever it is, there's circumstantial things that put you together. But then you've got lots of people that are like that. And why is it out of the 200 people you know by name in your class and the, you know, the, the, the 50 that are acquaintances and the 20 that are friends that this is your best friend? Something goes on. We say chemistry, but what we mean is we don't know. Right. And so I think keeping that we don't know open is a really hard thing to do because particularly if you're in my position, I've now got to be certain about ever, absolutely everything. And I don't, you know, it's just very funny. We, we take in um, 
folks who are a little bit older than you as interns locally from colleges in the area. And it used to be that when we'd finished screening a film with everybody present, I would go down the seniority charts. I'd start not with the editor, they could, they'd have to hold back, but I'd start with this person, the writer, and then I'd go to producer, an associate producer, and then other editors not working on that episode, and assistant editors, and the researchers, apprentice, you know, it's a, just still a handful of people, a dozen people. And then I'd ask the interns. But then I remembered when I was 21 and 22, I knew everything. Right. And so I've now reversed it. I asked the interns first because I want to hear from somebody who knows everything because I'm 69 and I know nothing. And I, I really want to hear from somebody who is absolutely certain and they never disappointed. And, and I'm not and I'm not saying that in any facetious or patronizing way. There is a confidence and, and a new way of seeing things when you're certain you know everything, just as there is a perhaps even more useful view from the wisdom of realizing how much you don't know. And all of that is, is a subset of the question that you're asking, uh, Prin. I think, it, and it's, it's an essential one. It's, and how to keep that flame alive. I mean, this is of course, at the heart of our religious teachings, at the heart of art. It's what is the energy that makes, um, relationships continue and thrive you know all, all of that stuff is is really at the heart of everything we just have all of us you know all seven of us happen to be struggling trying to figure out how to make historical documentaries right you know but it applies to everything how to keep that soul alive that's a really good question anybody I, else have anything yeah I have one Abigail? Question about um how you incorporate different elements of sound in your films I, you mentioned earlier, like uh, the narration and then music and different like sound effects and stuff like that. I've always struggled with sound and it's kind of been the last thing I focused on. I'm wondering where it comes in your process and how you use sound to help your story. Yeah, well, it's, you know, for me, it, it's, I realize it's what I say, you know, when people ask me the basic elements when they're getting started, I mean, the the middle school version of, of what you guys are doing, right? Um, not the high school version. I just say sound is the biggest thing, right? Like it will screw up all the time. You have to be very careful. But I think as we get closer and closer to it, I realized as I was looking through the camera and trying to find a, a medium shot and a close shot and a wide shot and a tilt and a pan and a reveal, uh, you know, on these still photographs, I was also listening to them. You know, were the troops tramping, were the cannons firing, were the, was the bat cracking, was the crowd cheering, you know, was that horse whinnying, you know? And so I was, Re, trying to take that still photograph and and say it once had a past and did have a future and 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 how do you will that alive and sound is a huge part of it now when you're editing for practical purposes at the beginning and maybe at the end for you guys you can only have a couple of sound effects tracks it gets too complicated when you're working on a three-part or a ten-part series um, so you're suggesting things, same with the music, but we record the music in advance of editing because music is the fastest art form, right? It's the only invisible art form. And so it works on you so quickly that we would rather not add the music at the end, but have it dictate the pace and rhythm of what we do. So that oral dimension is hugely important. It doesn't mean you have to have, once we lock the picture, we might open up and in the Battle of Gettysburg uh, have 160 tracks, right? At one point, we had 160 tracks back in the analog days. Now we can easily have that in in some other complicated scenes digitally, but you, it's a fool's errand to do that too early. But I do think there are signal and representative sounds that you can at the very beginning begin to put in, and it isn't just tramp, 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 or steamboat whistle or whatever it is. Maybe it is or bird, something that can anchor someone orally to suggest that what you're doing, they call it in, in art, the plasticity, that is the, the two dimensionality of it. Like we're looking at each other and we're essentially seven plastic photographs. But if I move my hand, that, that breaks it up. If you nod, that breaks it up, um, all of that. And you're looking for ways to break the, the sort of 
plasticity of it, the two dimensionality of it, the surface of it. And one of the ways you can do that very easily and very directly with sound effects, music, voice, first person voice, right? I, I sort of pioneered not just having a third person narrator, but voices reading diaries and letters and journals. So you had a sense of how people were and a talking head is a compliment to that. So I think at the heart of it, we, we just, it's half of it is sound. Half of it is sound easily. Well, you know, I think we probably were up to the last uh, stuff. If anybody has something final to say, you guys are terrific. I hope you continue. Are you, uh, can you show of hands of people who are, think you're going to do this again or have another project in them? Okay. Well, that's pretty good. looks like we're unanimous. Um, I wish you the best luck. Hope to see you again along the trail. And um, I've, I've gotten as much from you guys as I hope you've gotten from me. I think your films are wonderful. You tap you, every single one of you tackled very complex uh, things and you did so with this impossible limit of 10 minutes. I'm sure all of you at first were like, how can it be 10 minutes? And then it's like, how can it possibly be only 10 minutes? right? Uh, because you got so into it and you're looking at the worst, most profligate person. Well, you know, I have a 10 part series here and each episode is uh, an hour and a half or two hours long. So um, I do hope to see you guys down along the trail sometime uh, working in films and I wish you the best of luck. And I'm so glad there's an organization like the Better Angels to be able to um, acknowledge what you guys have done. And I know the National History Day is hugely important in, in funneling you towards that moment. And we're really terrifically happy if I can speak for the Better Angels, just to say that, that you're involved with this and that you're interacting with our larger professional components. And, and all of that will be a good thing for how we communicate in the future because more and more, not to take away from the greatest mechanical invention in the history of the world, the book, um, people are going to get um, their information from the way we communicate, the seven of us communicate. So I wish you the best of luck. And it's been a real privilege to be with you for this hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.